It is interesting the way that AI is changing so many things about business, but it is having an extreme impact on the data center world and how we build data centers, how we cool them, how we're gonna power them, what that looks like. Hello and welcome back to Care to Lead. Today, we are excited to have Jeremy P, CEO of Colo House and former SVP at Databank. With over two decades of experience, Jeremy is definitely an amazing choice to lead Colo House. Jeremy, there is so much going on in your industry and specifically at Colo House. And I'm really excited that you have a big announcement that you're going to share with us today. But Let's not let the cat out of the bag too soon. Let's begin by telling our listeners exactly what Colo Health does and why they need to know this. Absolutely, Cynthia. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Colo House is really around data center co-location, private cloud, bare metal services. And the reason that's important is because really we are here to make sure that applications, websites, all of the pieces that come in, in terms of what the world is calling edge now, which means, you know, for the users at home, how am I getting, you know, data and information to my laptop? How am I using all the websites and applications, my fridge that's talking to me or my coffee maker that's talking to me? How is all of that happening? And really we're providing the solutions that companies go to, to be able to facilitate the backend infrastructure that runs for all of those websites and applications. So what are the, some of the main advantages of co-location? So co-location really offers, you know, users to be able to have a 24 by seven location that the companies can go to and know I'm going to put my, all of my infrastructure in terms of servers, hardware, network resources, I'm going to be able to put it in this facility and know that it will have 24 by seven uptime because data centers really provide backup power, backup cooling all of these pieces that are necessary, whereas companies, you know, say 20 plus years ago, and, and unfortunately there's still some companies that will do it today, you know, put servers into a, a room within their offices or into a different location, but there's not a lot of backups in terms of power or cooling, if anything were to happen to the grid that they're on or anything like that. And so these are the facilities they can go to and be able to put all of that in there and not have to worry about that. And so each evolution for us in terms of the products we offer within that data center are another phase and evolution of helping the customer take care of things that are really capital intensive to build these types of facilities, to generate these types of facilities and to maintain them is extremely expensive. It's very capital intensive. And these companies want to be able to take advantage of those, those pieces without having to actually put all that capital up front and just have it for a monthly cost. So there's a good return on investment for them. And for us, co-location is the piece where they can just put all of their infrastructure in there. Bare metal, we can put that infrastructure in them, in there for them, and they can run their application on top of that infrastructure. Or cloud is allowing us to do everything from monitoring, maintaining, virtualization for the customer. So all they have to do is put their application there, and then they're pretty much hands off and they're able to, to run that with a minimal IT team. So it's really providing multiple ways for companies to be able to run their websites and applications based on how big of an organization are and the type of IT team that they have. I don't want to date myself or anything, but like I can totally remember organizations when there was this just big room with all the servers and it was air conditioned. It had to be up on a platform floor and just the, ex not, I mean, I don't remember way back when, but <laughs> I did myself. But yeah, I mean, it, it was a real thing and that expense was astronomical. So that seems like a massive ROI for an organization to be investing in co-location. Absolutely. No, it is. And it's interesting because the data center environment has changed dramatically. And even within the last six months to a year, AI now has a new impact on the data center environment and the way that it plays. You were talking about that raised floor piece. It's interesting now that now with how much power and density and the heaviness of the racks and the way that they're getting in terms of everything that's happening, now some are wanting to go back to slab floor because, you know, that raised floor can't handle the impact of the heaviness of the servers. And then there's a whole nother layer of cooling and power. And 
AI density that is just, it's changing the game of data center providers and they're having to be able to be flexible. Talk about, you know, going back and my dad worked in IT back in the day and they had the cards and the, you know, going into those machines. If you really want to go, go back that far. And now you think about for these computers that are running these high density programs on AI, they have water cooling going directly to the chip and thinking about a water anywhere around a server 20 to 30 years ago was unimaginable. But now, you know, the technology has it to where water is basically going to the chip to cool it down because it's it's such high power, high frequency. And so it's crazy to think about how technology has changed and transformed. But absolutely, data centers are providing so many opportunities and so many paths for companies to be able to meet that demand because that cost, as you said, is astronomical. And being able to do that on a monthly basis that's manageable for the organization is a huge impact for the overall businesses out there that don't have that type of capital to deploy. So how do you as an organization keep up with with the rapid changes? You have multiple data centers. So I'd like to know how many you have and where they are. But more importantly, or not more importantly, but equally as importantly, I'm curious how you keep up. Like, how do you keep making the innovations in all of these data centers? That's got to be astronomically expensive as well. Well, you know, capital expenditures is definitely a part of this business. It really is a part of something that we have to manage on a on an annual basis. How much is our capital going to be and how much of that is maintenance purchase? How much of that is for growth based on new customer demand? And so we have 10 data centers across the United States right now. We have a huge presence on the East Coast from Miami to Albany to Orangeburg, New York, to multiple data centers in Chicago. And then we spread over to, you know, Colorado Springs, Cheyenne, Phoenix. So we're pushing a little more towards the West Coast, but we obviously have a huge presence, you know, on the East Coast, Atlanta as well, which is one of the locations I didn't mention there. But, you know, in terms of how we keep up with that, it really is about making sure that we are keeping up with partners that are bringing a lot of that technology to the industry. Because, you know, at the end of the day, Water cooling technology is just not something we're going to be able to do as an organization. So we have to keep a partner network of providers that can bring that when the customer needs it. So whether that's adjusting and looking at a new build and we have a customer that says they want slab four and they're going to want water cooling to the chip, then we've got to adjust our build to be able to meet that demand. But it also comes with the fact that, you know, a lot of these builds are, are you know, bigger builds and things of that nature for us. So we know that we can go ahead and build out an ROI based on that investment up front, but then the monthly revenue based on the contract that we're able to put together to get that return on an investment. We, you know, and usually for us, that's within a, you know, a 12 to 18 month period in terms of the ROI for these types of projects. That's awesome. And being a CEO of an organization with multiple locations, multiple partners, multiple things happening, pretty big job. So I like to delve into leadership, obviously, with everything that I do. And everyone likes to talk about all of the great things they've accomplished over the years in leadership. But I personally like to talk about some of the bumps in the road along the way. So I'm curious, what is the biggest leadership lesson that you've learned by making a mistake? And how does that lesson impact how you lead Colo House? Absolutely. Well, you know, I think uh, the biggest lesson I learned is how to manage up. And y- it's interesting to say that as a CEO, because you think, well, you're the CEO. There is no up. Well, no, there is a There's board. board. <laughs> yeah, there is a board. <laughs> it's a board as far. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and we're private equity owned as well, right? So the board constitutes part of that private equity firm, but there's also relationships within that private equity firm that are, you know, necessary for me to be able to manage relationships with and and all of those pieces. And so to me, that is managing up now. But even as a leader earlier on in my career, I really didn't understand what it meant to manage up and how, you know, being clear with your leadership above helps everybody execute at a at a potential pace. And and I think one of the things I learned was you never know what your boss is dealing with. No matter how much, how close you are or how much you are in sync with them, you never know all of the things that they're dealing with at that level. And so there's always a challenge every, every level that you step up. And so helping them understand and clearly communicating to them what's going on in your organization, the needs and being extremely clear on all of that is really important. That's helped me here in terms of managing to the board, 
but there's also, you know, a book, Extreme Ownership that I love. One of my favorite business books I've ever read that talks about it. And I share that with my team as well to help them understand, you know, it, for each of them as a senior leader, how do you manage up to help your leader understand the expectations of what you really need to be successful? Because if you're sitting back and saying, well, they're not giving me what I need and they don't understand and they don't get that. Well, that's because you're not communicating it to them in the right way. And so I use that so that each leader in the organization knows, yes, it's important to understand how to manage your teams and really help them grow and to manage at a parallel level with each one of the leaders at your level. But managing up is a critical part to success as a leader as well. And so I learned that lesson very early on when I was at hosting.com and I was like, leadership, just not getting it. And then I, I read that book and I go, oh, that's because I'm not communicating. And it was amazing how much we accomplished over that next two year period. Once I was clearly communicating, putting together presentations that clearly laid out the plan, what needed to happen, what the ROI was, what all of those pieces looked like to be able to help my leadership understand what we needed to be successful. And it completely changed the way that we operated. And so I, that's been something that I've learned that I bring to any organization that I'm at because it's extremely critical in, in the success of leading your team, but also leading your leaders to help your team. That, that's a really valid point, a very excellent point. And I think one thing that I'd like to even add on to that in part of managing up is I, you, you kind of hinted to it in the beginning of, of your explanation when you said you don't know what they're dealing with. And I always tell leaders that when it comes to managing up, that they have people they're answering to as well. So when you're communicating, when you can make them see the connection that how helping you and supporting you is furthering their needs and their agendas, it's so much easier. And sometimes people take that term managing up and they think of it as manipulative or, you know, I, I want to get my boss to do what I want them to do, but that's not it at all. It is communicating clearly. It is supporting that person you're managing up. It's helping them get what they need as much as getting what you need. And I think that's, it's a give and take there. Absolutely. And I think one of the things people think is, well, if I do that properly, then it means I should get everything that I ask my leader for. And that's not what it's about at the end of the day either, right? not about manipulating them into getting what you want or what you need. It's about informing them of the needs of the team, how that can be valuable for them, but also understanding that there's hard decisions that have to be made as a leader all the time. We have to decide what products we're going to go after, how much we're going to put into sales and marketing, what we're going to do here and there. And as a CEO sitting in this seat, I can tell you I have a new appreciation for the CEOs that I worked for before in terms of man, I was just asking for this from an operational perspective, but I didn't understand all the different asks that were coming. And so um, it is it, it is about just helping them understand your need, the impact to them, how that's going to look for the overall organization. And also understanding doesn't mean you're going to get what you want every time, but it is helpful to them to understand so that they decide not to, they know why and they know the impact. Yeah, that that's super important as well. One of the things I, I tell leaders all the time if they're complaining because I'm not getting what I need, I'm not getting what I need. And we go through this, you know, they, they did communicate and they did all this. One of the things I asked them to do, I said, all right, let's just like for a moment, take off your CEO hat. And I want you to put on the hat of the, you know, chairman of the board. I want you to literally sit in that perspective. And I want you to tell me what you have to think about. And then it changes the way they see their ask. Because now they know, oh, he's answering to this person and he has to worry about, you know, 15 things over here that aren't on my, on my radar. They're on his radar. So when you can actually physically imagine yourself as that person and look at your ask from their perspective entirely, it's a game changer. Absolutely. No, 100%. And that's something that, you know, I think about, you know, when you're especially a CEO reporting to a private equity firm. You got to understand they've got an investor base that has invested a lot of money in these organizations, and especially in this space. I mean, you look at the billions and billions of dollars that are being put into the space, because as we talk about the capital requirements that are necessary, and you think about how these investors are looking at each of their investments and they want to see these types of returns and these types of, you know, opportunities based on the dollars they've invested. So I have to think about that from the investor relation perspective of the PE as well as the board, right? And so um, absolutely, it's extremely critical to take that step back and think about it. And again, while, like I said, 
this managing up piece is something that I think leaders, I, I don't think they learn early enough. And so that's why I try to help my leaders understand that early on as we get involved, because it's so critical to the success of an organization at every level. I love that. So Jeremy, I want to ask you, what are some characteristics that you think are necessary to succeed as a leader today? Because let's face it, today's a dynamic, changing, constant motion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think number one, you know, I, I joke about this with my leaders at times and I go, it's amazing how common sense these days can really help a leader be successful, right? <laughs> it's just, you, you think about it and we get so wrapped up in the asks that come to us and what our employees are asking us or what our leaders are asking us. And we don't, we don't step back to think about what is the simple answer here? Really? What is, and, and I, to me, it's like, it's that common sense piece. And so I'll have leaders come to me and I go, well, did you think about it from this perspective? Or did you think about it from this perspective? And I go, no, I didn't, I didn't step. And it's, so it's stepping back with that common sense lens that I talk about. Um, and it's amazing how, when leaders are able to do that and really think in a natural way, um, and step back, it can help them be extremely successful. At the other part, I, I, I say servant leadership now is as critical as it's ever been in this industry. And I say that because you're dealing with different employee dynamics than we've ever dealt with before, right? I, when I started, it was still a point in business where it was like, everybody worked as hard as they could and everybody was just pushing and constantly pushing. And there's a different dynamic now in terms of the employer-employee balance of understanding and appreciating your employees, what they bring to the table and helping them understand where they are in their journey, as well as their impact to the organization. So really helping them be successful is something that's critical now in a way that I think, you know, we just kind of understood back in the late nineties that when I, you know, started, it was, we all just worked really hard and the, the boss was just there to kind of keep us motivated and keep us going. And now I think it's about engaging those employees, building the right culture, pulling all of that together so that they understand the value and what they're doing. And so I think the last one for me, if I think about a third one, it's transparency. And I think that's so missed many times in so many places in the workplace today. But I will tell you as a leader, I could tell you the value that it brings to our organization um, by having an all hands every month. And I joke that I have a legal officer who knows me really well. So they keep me from saying things that I, I shouldn't be saying at the end of the day. Because I like to share as much as I can with the employees so that they know what's going on in the company. Because again, that visibility helps them understand, oh, this is how my piece impacts what the business is doing and what matters. And here's where we're going. Here's the challenges we're having as, as a business versus here's our successes and celebrating those. And so I think transparency is something that, you know, especially again, you talk about 20 to 30 years ago, didn't exist. I think we're getting better at it through leaderships that I've seen across companies that I've worked with. But I think that's absolutely critical based on the workforce that we have today. So I think those are just three things that I go, if a leader really wants to be successful today in this space, in this industry, those are three things I really think they have to focus on. That's great. And I'm sure that as you have moved up in your career, those have become more and more important to you. As you get to the next level, you have another layer of leadership you need to work with and to help grow and, and evolve and helping them evolve their leadership, you know, with that as well. So it, it just becomes more and more critical, you know, each step that you take. That's great. So I understand you have a little bit of exciting news to share with our listeners today. Would you like to dive into that? Absolutely. Yeah. So appreciate the opportunity, but Cola House is excited. We are going to be making an acquisition of a company by the name of High Velocity. We are extremely excited about what they bring to the table. Uh, they have what we consider one of the best technological leaders in terms of bare metal platforms. And so the technology, the automation that they bring for developers on that platform, as well as the network automation and capabilities they've built around that platform is extremely impressive. And we feel like it's one of the best in the industry and we're excited to have that be a part of what we do. As I talked about earlier, you know, our vision is to do retail co-location, cloud and bare metal services. And so this really takes a huge technological step forward, a product step forward that probably would have taken us anywhere from five to six years to build. But to be able to bring that on 
and also with another provider in the space that is focused on customer service on top of automation. Their NPS score is industry leading. Um, we ext- we're extremely happy that they have that same customer focused mindset that we do. And all this really does is we we're really putting around this idea of automation when the customer needs it, but customer service when the customer wants it. And this is just another piece of that platform that will be extremely critical in being able to deliver that, deliver that to our customer base. So we're really excited to have High Velocity and Colo House come together as two organizations here in 2024. Oh, that's exciting. Are you going to will this expand your footprint geographically? It will expand our footprint quite significantly. We will have a significant West Coast presence with some more facilities in California, as well as Washington State, but it will also expand our geographies internationally. They have 40 different locations across six different continents. So that is a huge expansion for us in terms of geography. So between the platform, the customer service, and now the ability for us to expand our capabilities, both across the United States, as well as internationally, is extremely exciting. Well, that is exciting. And I'm going to ask you another CEO question. So how are you going to continue as the CEO to make sure that the organization lives the vision of one team, one mission? Absolutely. No, I'm extremely excited about that. I mean, look, one of the things I love about being a CEO and being a leader in general all the way coming up is about building a team. And I I coached high school sports, I coached select sports. So like building a team has just been natural in everything that I've done even early on in my career when I was developing, but doing all of that on the side is always about how you pull that together. So they're based out of Tampa, Florida. Most of their team is actually there. About 80% of their workforce still works out of locations down there in Tampa. So I'm going to be spending a significant amount of time down there with a team in Tampa, especially across the first six months, having you know my leadership team as it exists today, coming down and spending time with those teams and showing them, you know, what our values are, what our mission is, you know, what we're looking to accomplish and making sure we're communicating that from day one. I mean, we built our mission, vision and values based on Lencioni's advantage. And the thing that he talked about is communicate, communicate, over communicate and constantly communicate clarity. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to let that team know we care. We're here. We want you to be a part of this organization. We're excited to have you as a part of this organization. And we want to show you what one team, one mission, people first means to us as an organization and show that to them by being there with them and standing side by side with them as we go through this transition, knowing it's going to be a big transition for them and the organization as a whole. But we're really excited about it. And we we look forward to them being excited about what this means for the next generation of our company. That's super, super exciting. And a lot of times when you make big announcements like this, there's always people who are just misinformed about what what your industry does and what it can offer and how this is going to like change the dynamic. So are there any misconceptions about co-location in general that you would like to take the time to debunk as you because you're you're expanding, you're growing, you're doing some amazing things and there's still some misconceptions probably out there. I think the biggest min- misconception is that public cloud is the solution for everything and that It can be the end all be all for organizations. But, you know, the key is, is that there are different workloads and different applications that require different types of technologies, different types of capability, capability and different geographies. You know, when we look at the high velocity customer base and what that's bringing to our organization, there are geographies that public cloud providers just cannot get to today. So there's a lot of streaming, gaming companies that have to go to platforms like high velocities, like their bare metal platform, come to cloud providers like us to be able to get to edge locations, to different geographies that the public cloud providers can't provide. And also a lot of the thought is, oh, but public cloud is going to be cheaper at the end of the day. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. If you actually look at it and you look at the details of the economics of running a platform there versus here, There's different things in terms of egress fees and charges that they bring to the table that a lot of companies don't look at. You look at them apples to apples and you bring it to the table. It's amazing how providers like ours can do one. We're going to provide an amazing customer service experience because you're not going to get that at the big public cloud providers. 
Two, usually our costs are going to be better for them for the overall business. And three, again, it's really a matter of geography and location is so critical to so many companies today that we can provide a more diverse geographic opportunity for those customers. So I think that's the thing in our industry right now is that, you know, all these people see AWS commercials on the NFL or they see Azure commercials and Google and all these. And and it's not to say that those platforms aren't great and aren't amazing in their own way because they absolutely are. But there are needs for providers like us that can do things for organizations, both SMB to, you know, to middle, middle sized enterprises that really can be a competitive solution with a great service platform for customers. So that's, that's awesome. And you really clearly identified some of the benefits of going to co-location. But I'm curious for our listeners who might be thinking about it, like they're debating, do I want to go cloud? Do I want to go co-location? What are some possible risks that they might be taking by not moving to co-location? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one is, you know, again, as we talked about before, the extreme costs that are necessary to be able to run these types of facilities on your own. So there, there is one piece in that. Again, for the companies that are not even doing that within a data center, they might still be doing it within their own organization. Somebody sent me a picture of a server closet. The room was named server closet and they, I guess they still exist out there. There's a lot of risk to that because again, you don't have the power redundancy. You don't have the backup in terms of cooling. And that's really, really and I can tell you from experience being, you know, in the space, it just takes a, you know, a millisecond and a loss of power. And that can really, really mess up hardware and technology. So, you know, the risks are not being able to have that power and that cooling back up, that necess- the necessity for 24 seven capabilities. But it's also, you know, if you're working with a smaller team that doesn't have all of the capabilities necessary to support the environment, to manage it, to patch it, to w- look at the backups and consistently do all those different pieces, the business is at risk there. And then you talk about disaster recovery on top of that. So these are all the things that a business has to be able to manage. And some of them are doing that with minimal IT staffs. And so there's a lot of risk to not doing those things and not having everything necessary. And I didn't even go into cybersecurity and all the, all the pieces that come along with that and compliance. And there's so many pieces that we offer as part of the platform that a customer would have to do all on their own if they didn't come to a provider like ours. It's a lot of risk. That's, Absolutely that, it is. That's good that you're taking care of it. So now I know you don't have a crystal ball, but there's a lot of emerging technologies that, and things are changing constantly. So what do you see is the most exciting things that are coming in the future of co-location? Yeah, I think it's around this expanding dynamic of the fact that we're changing so many ways in terms of how we're going to deal with the power consumption model and the way that it's changing. It's exciting and scary all at the same time because then you got to figure out how you're going to completely change the way that data centers were meant to be built. We were building all these data centers with the idea that we were going to be five kilowatts per rack, maybe 10 kilowatts per rack. And so we built it with the idea of how to bring enough power to a certain amount of square footage and how to cool that. Well, now you start looking at AI and even beyond AI, there's other technologies that are now pushing 50, 60, 80 kilowatts per rack. Well, that completely changes the way that you deal with a data center. Again, we talked about water cooling to the chip, but you start to talk about cooling, you know, those types of racks at a massive capacity in a massive square footage, you know, portion of a data center. And then you think about how now you're going to have to bring five to six to seven times more power into that square footage than you ever anticipated. So, I mean, it is interesting the way that AI is changing so many things about business, but it is having an extreme impact on the data center world and how we build data centers, how we cool them, how we're going to power them, what that looks like. And then it comes to the point of, again, there, there are power companies out there that are saying, guys, hands up. I only got so much and I can't deliver, you know, Northern Virginia, the, the main power provider out there saying I can't provide it until 2026. So now as data center providers, how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to come up with alternatives? There's alternatives to power, but even then wind, solar, all these different components can only bring so much to that power equation as well. So it's a, it's definitely an interesting time to be in this space and to see the changes because it came, it was so standard for the last 20 years in terms of how data centers were built, what the expectations were, and you could build them and you knew that that's exactly how it was going to be. And this is now changing the, the game. And over the next five years, I'm really interested to see how it plays out. It's exciting and it's scary. I think of a for a business owner who just 
uh, you know, they, they want to just run their organization. They just want to get their things done. And this whole IT piece and all of this is just another headache. So it, if I'm not wrong, it sounds like you can really take care of a lot of those headaches. And I, I like what you talked about, cybersecurity and, and compliance, because those are so huge. And just to take that off of a, a, another CEO's plate and let them do what they do best that that's like such a gift that you're that you're out there offering. Look, you just you put our sales pitch on the table right there, Cynthia. I mean, I, that's it, right? Is what can we solve for you as an organization so that you don't have to be up at night worrying about those things? And we always talk about do what you do best, run your business, and let us worry about the IT complications on the back end, so that you're not having to worry about cyber attacks, so that you're not having to worry about the compliance that's necessary for your regulators or whatever industry you're in, we can match all of those and understand what those needs are for you as an organization. And again, you know, eliminating a lot of that capital expenditure that allows them to spend money on R&M and other things for their business because they know there's a monthly number that I know is coming in every day in terms of my OPEX, but I'm not having to think about spending millions of dollars on CapEx for my business just to run the IT portion. So It really is about simplifying business for other CEOs out there that really want to focus on, just like you said, what they're good at. And that's what we love to do for them. Yeah, it's interesting because I work with a lot of CEOs and every day I'm having conversations and I know how much is on their plate. I know how much they're dealing with. I know how crazy their schedules are. Just this one piece that seems small, but is huge. It is just such a gift. So for our listeners who would want to learn more about Colo House, where can they connect with you? Absolutely. You can go to www.colohouse.com. That's C-O-L-O-H-O-U-S-E, just as it's uh, it's spelled out there. And all of our information is there. And you can, anybody can reach out to me at any point in time. My team gives me a hard time because I actually manage the CEO inbox. They're like, don't do that. We can take care of that for you. I go, no, I want to know what's going on. I want to respond. It's my CEO inbox. And so that's uh, CEO at colohouse.com as well. So always happy to answer questions, always happy to be involved. I love talking to customers, love talking to prospects or anybody that just wants to know about the space or the industry as a whole. I love being out there and, and promoting what we do because I think it's extremely valuable. And, you know, this is the next layer of infrastructure. It is, you know, beyond the power and the, the grid infrastructure that was built for power. You think about internet and its capabilities and the technology piece. This is the infrastructure for the next generation of what we're doing across the world. So it's exciting to be a part of this. So always happy to talk about it. It is exciting. And congratulations on your your big announcement. And before we go, I'd like our listeners to get to know the CEO just a little bit better. So I'd like to jump into a CEO lightning round if you're ready. Let's do it. Let's get into it. Do you prefer cats or dogs? I'm a dogs guy. I'm a dogs guy for sure. Cats. As much as uh, the funny thing is, is I've had more cat over the last like five years, but it doesn't seem to work well. Like once they're a kitten, they like me there. I'm warm. And then all of a sudden as they grow up, they just don't have any interest in me after that. Dogs, that love never goes away. So definitely that dog. Is true. That is true. But dog and cats don't bark during a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we moved out to like three acres of privacy so that I don't, we have a dog that does bark and very easily. So now we don't have anything for him to be barking at. So that's yeah. not the positive. So what's your favorite order in Starbucks? Oh, see, I'm not a coffee guy, but I will say at the end of the day, I can occasionally do a caramel frappuccino because it just has to be a little sweet for me. So if I'm going to go, that's where I go because I still have to get it for my wife on a, on a decent basis. So if I'm feeling it for an extra treat, a caramel frappuccino is where I go. Last place you went on vacation. Oh, uh, we went to Belize. So it was our first time to Belize, a uh, nice little island out there. We're, we're beach people. And so going to Exuma in about a month and a half, which is a nice little island off the Bahamas, probably one of our favorite places to go. But yeah, beach people in Belize was the last one in October. Thing you regret most in your career? Cool, man. <laughs> uh, uh, I would say not taking an opportunity, but I think that the way that I got where I am is by taking a, a number of opportunities. I think it's early on in my career. I just didn't understand the way that leadership worked with employees. And it's it's funny to think that I've changed this dynamic now, but I think just the way that I 
didn't appreciate my leaders early on in my career. I regret that. And I wish I had shown them a little more appreciation for what they were doing, what they were trying to do and how they guided and mentored me. I, I didn't do that for probably about the first five years of my career. And then once I woke up, it was amazing how my career changed from there. That's awesome. How about the top three things on your bucket list? Oh, uh, going to Augusta to watch the Masters. I got to do that at some point in time. Not going to happen this year because acquisition is going to have me crazy busy. I would say also Italy. My wife and I are trying to get to Italy sometime soon. We want to go check out the Amalti Coast, do all of that. And then I would say beyond that, probably also on that bucket list is going to play Pebble Beach. So those are probably my top three right now. I got to play Pebble Beach. I had no business on that golf course, but it was a lot of fun. So what's the last show you binge watched? We just watched, what's the one with Sofia Vergara? Griselda, I think that I, was. Yeah, um, I, it's about the the lady that she was one of the female from Colombia, from Medellin, Medellin back in the day. I mean, she wound up being kind of like a Miami drug lord almost in the United States. And it was kind of like a, a bio, well, a, however you want to say that it was a six episode special, but it was intense. And I just, I, I, sometimes I'm amazed by what happened and how that happened and all of the things that go on. I just, I go, is this real life? Did this really happen? And it's crazy to, to, to see those types of stories. Oh, that's fun. And last but not least, do you have a favorite quote? Oh, I, you know what? It's not an official quote, I, um, but my grandfather always told me the school that you're going to learn the greatest lessons from is a school of hard knocks. That's one that stuck with me forever is just, you know, you're going to learn the most from the challenges, from the hard times, from all of that that happens far more than you're going to learn from your successes. And so that's one that will always stay with me. And it's, it's always been true. Definitely have learned some things from successes, but have learned most from failures, which is why I always tell my teams, we're going to fail, but we're going to learn so much from it and we're going to fail forward. So that's really what it's all about for me. I love that. And I think that that is an official quote. We'll make sure that we pull that out and get it in with our show notes so that people, people catch that. And Jeremy, thank you so much for being here today. I really love talking to you. Thank you for sharing your news with us. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to Care to Lead today. And you can find us on YouTube and anywhere that you find your podcast. And thank you very much, Jeremy. It was so much fun talking to you. Thank you, Cynthia. I appreciate the opportunity. It was wonderful speaking with you as well. 